Um, so I am Beth Orcutt. I am a um, senior scientist at the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences. Um, but more importantly for today, I am part of the CDB team. Um, and so it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker today, Dr. Rose Jones. Um, oh, OK. Uh, sorry, I was looking at a chat message. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, introducing Dr. Rose Jones, who's going to be our um, first speaker of this year's Network Speaker Series for CDETI. Um, and I'm very excited to hear what she's going to talk about. Um, to introduce Rose to you, um, uh, Rose comes to us from the lovely United Kingdom across the ocean, um, where she got her um, uh, PhD at Bangor University, researching curious microbes that survive in acidic conditions and thinking about um, uh, mine remediation and things like that. Um, so she has a few papers about describing novel species like acidithrix ferooxidans and their role in um, iron oxidation. After her PhD, she um, moved over the ocean and joined the Bigelow Lab. Uh, and she worked with my team uh, for a few years studying um, microbes that live in deep oceanic crust and thinking about how she could try to convince them to be alive with electricity, um, as well as a variety of other things which we might hear about today. And after her postdoc in my group, she joined uh, the group of Brandy Toner at the University of Minnesota where she's been for the past year and a half or so, um, involved in a project studying microbial uh, mineral interactions in the deep sea near the East Pacific Rice, which I think will be the majority of Rose's talk today. Um, uh, before we get started, just a reminder to folks that um, uh, if you have a question, please feel free to use the chat box um, at the bottom of the screen to type in your question, and we'll come to those at the end of the presentation, um, and I'll read them out to Rose because sometimes they don't show up while you have your screen open. Um, uh, a reminder to everybody that this, record, this is being recorded, um, and so if you are not comfortable with that, then I guess you shouldn't be joining, um, but so the chat messages and things might um, uh, be shared. Um, and if there's any technical problems, feel free to also send a, a message to myself or Matthew Janicek, who is the CW IT guru who's helping us with this event today. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to get started. So go ahead, Rose. Yeah, thank you. Um, oops. So yeah, I'm interested in particular in how microbes and minerals interact and influence each other. So to create the environment that we can see, especially in non-standard or extreme environments where conditions that change, conditions of chemistry and biology and everything else can be somewhat different. But why would you care about microbe-mineral inter micro interactions? Well, the, there are very few environments that are totally devoid of life on Earth. And by doing what it does, life then interacts with the environment and it changes it. So to really understand the environment, you also have to understand how life is influencing it. And we can do this in two ways. We can look at how, from the environment's perspective, so how it, shape, how it shapes life there by the physical and resource conditions that it, that it poses, like um, cold, snowy environments make white, thick, fluffy fur an advantage. You can also look at it from the life's perspective to see what that can tell us about the environment. For example, certain desert plants have thick, deep roots, which means that the water that they need is deep and hard to get. Which is all very well, but when you start to actually pour in all the information that we have, it can start to get very dense, like this. And the, hard, the more information you put in, the harder it can be to interpret. So how do you deal with that? Well, you can group things together. You can start to summarize it. And then you can start to look for patterns. But how might you group them together? You can group by what they're made of, what they look like, where they come from, 
who they're related to. You can also group them based on what they eat. And this is what I'm particularly interested in because it can also tell you a bit about the environment or the thing being at. Um, but how do you figure out what a microbe eats? Well, if you're unfamiliar with these books, this is, these, guys, these books were written by Gerald Durrell, who was a conservationist from the 1940s to the 1990s. And he would go out on expeditions to find animals and to bring them back for zoos. And he'd write books about them. And a large part of, a large part of these books is describing trying to find out what your animal ate and then trying to find a replacement that a European zoo would find that would be able to supply them which is not really dissimilar to what we do sometimes with microbes, but try and find what they're eating. And if you want to culture them, then you have to try and um, figure out something that's acceptable. But to try and actually figure out what the microbe is eating is a lot harder than if you're dealing with a weasel or a bird. And to figure out what exactly that environment, like life interaction is. And so you have to get creative. So the first, section of work I'm going to talk about is looking at what the environment, in this case a hydrothermal vent, can tell us about life in this environment. And a hydrothermal vent, well what is a hydrothermal vent? Well the subsurface isn't a solid block of mineral, it's full of cracks and flow paths which are then full, which are full of fluid. And this fluid is heated as it goes along these cracks and flow paths. And it becomes anoxic, enriched in metals and sulfur, and the temperatures can reach above 350 degrees Celsius. And when it exits the crust, it mixes with cold oxygenated seawater, forming these chimney-like structures of precipitated metal sulfides which you can see in the image on the right, you can see these different colored minerals as they're building up through the, the, the chimney being built up. And we also know that there's life here, partly because the chemolithotrophs, microbes that eat minerals, are the basis of the food web in this sunless ecosystem. So, these vents change over time, they're a dynamic environment. So it would make sense that the life that's around there, and any if their life is interacting with the mineral, then that would also change over time. So these vents go from hot, active black smokers, which the temperatures can be very high, down through warm, active, to once the, the fluid turns off, if they then become dead or which can be dead pieces lying around an active site or the off axis dead stuff, which is stuff that's clearly been dead a very long time, has been separated from the fluid that was kicking up. And so in this study, we wanted to look at how, whether we could find out whether any, we could find any evidence of the microbial community switching from the dissolved, using mainly the dissolved minerals for energy, like they do in the hot active sites, to the solid mineral sulfides that are around in the cold and the very dead off axis sites. Because that would then change, because in theory, the, the environment, if the minerals and the microbes interact with each other, that would look different if it was purely abiotic. And so we went down to East Pacific Rise 9 North to collect these the hydro, to the hydrothermal vent site there. We motored on the seafloor in Alvin and picked up samples from the hot active site and then the dead cold stuff that was lying around close and then some of the very off axis, very long dead stuff. And you'll hear me refer to the hot active stuff and then the sort of dead but lying around stuff as inactive and then the off axis stuff was dead stuff. And we took these up onto the ship 
and then as soon as possible we split them up to try to um, taking care to keep track of the orientation so which is the oxygen water interface which is the inside which has got the chimney and then we pack them and uh, nitrogen as soon as we could to try and stop any oxidation from just exposure to air and we turn them then to thin sections so 30 micron or so slivers on a slide we then take this slide and stick it under a synchrotron which is a giant x-ray generation facility and then we take this thin section and we we bombard the sample with these high energy x-rays and from the different kinds of energy we get back we can tell things like the elemental makeup valence state and minerals mineral content of our samples to very fine scale and so this is the kind of thing we get back which is on the left, you can see the true color image, and on the right, you can see these element maps with iron, red, zinc, and green, and arsenic, and blue. And you can see even between the hot active and the dead colds from a single site, you see those definitely, they definitely start to look different. I will say that the colors intensity here denotes how much of a mineral is there in a sort of semi-quantitative way. The colour is also relative to itself, not to everything. We can then do a little bit, dig into a little bit deeper and from these specific points ask what is the mineral at this specific point? And then we get these sort of energy fingerprints back and when we compare that to a database we can identify which minerals these are. And then I took all of the samples from all of the sites and asked, well, how often do these, does this mineral crop up? Which gives you then this frequency plot. So how much of, out of all the samples, how many of them come up as pyrite or marcosite? And this is the general, this is the general results. And you can see there's quite a lot going on for samples which are only maybe an inch and we're drilling into like five microns. So there's an awful lot going on within a small amount of, of space. You can also then start to sim well, not simplify but pick out different stories. And the first one is just the FES minerals, which here I've picked out going from the brighter color, the lighter color, the for FES down to pyrite and red. And this scale is sort of going from the most reactive mineral down to the less reactive minerals. But when we look at where, how, where these occur in the different types of vent, so the active, the hot black smokers, the inactive, which is the bit lying around, and the very dead off axis site, you can see mostly it goes from the more reactive, and as time goes on, it goes to the less reactive, apart from the FES, which you wouldn't really make sense because these are the least reactive, so you'd expect if it was just simply abiotic over time, these would have gone by the time you end up at this very old site. And when we drill into the FES bin, the FES group, you can see, we can see that there is FES. There's also there's some iron three and also some iron two, which means there's probably evidence of some perhaps iron cycling going on in this dead site. And when we look at the location, so where these are within a single sample, so within that inch block, you have the Rhine, which is the oxygen water interface, and then the middle bit, and then the, the inside bit. And you can see again this FES is cropping up on the Rhine. And there's a picture of one of these on the on the right. And you can see the orange thick goop stuff in between the darker metal sulfides. And this FES is this iron cycling seems to be going on in this goopy stuff. We also know that 
from in other environments like in acid mine drainage environments this the iron rind is where you'd see life you'd see microbes so it's starting to like maybe there's some iron cycling and maybe there's microbes introduced into that when we look at the other secondary alteration minerals it sort of says the same thing you see the copper alteration in blue the rest the iron three alteration in pink the iron two alteration in purple and then the FES is in yellow you can see the FES and the iron two is popping up in the dead site in the rind so there might be some iron cycling going on and maybe there'll be microbes involved but to be continued because we're still digging through this so we'll hear about this more the second so that's how you look at that's one way the environment can tell us about what life might be what the microbes might be using you can also look at what the microbes can tell us about an environment and for this i looked at the cool oxic basalt and there's an awful lot because the hydrothermal beds are a very small part of the seafloor and the rest of it is mostly basalt which is a volcanic rock high in silica iron and manganese with a few others scattered about depending on where you are there's also a surprising amount well not surprising but there's an awful lot of there's there is an appreciable amount of oxygen in the seafloor crust which means that's an awful lot of area for iron oxidation reactions to happen which normally we think of as you need to wait for the micro the, the iron to be in a dissolved form for a microbe to use it so your electron goes from your electron donor to your electron acceptor it's oxidized and then it passes through the microbe to be used for ATP generation and whatever else. There are, however, some microbes that can get their energy from solid substrates, either via electron shuttles or direct electron transfer. So they have conductive, the they have conductive, they have conductive peli, things like that. And by conductive, I mean the electrons can move along it. And um, there's actually a case to be made for that being an advantage to a microbe in the basalt crust, which is a very resource poor environment. So there's not actually very much else. So there's a case to be made for the microbes being able to use that solid iron oxidation and we know there are microbes that can do this and we're finding them in freshwater sediment and in, there are some being found in hydrothermal vents potentially so we know they're around but are they around in the deep cold basalt and that's what we start, set out to find out and in this case we went to North Pond on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge which is a pool of sediment and which was drilled in 2011 down through the sediment into the crust beneath. And in that, basically in those boreholes, you ended up, there were corks installed. So these are long strings of instruments and porous cases with stour rock chips in them, which are then suspended down. And the idea being that the fluid is passing through the crust and these star rock chips are bathed in the fluid and they start to collect whatever's living down there. It's a sort of mouse, humane mouse trap, but for rock chips. You can see the difference between the fresh new stuff on the top and then the, the stuff that had been sitting down there for about six years on the bottom. And we then took these rock chips and stuck them in a bioelectrochemistry setup, which basically means instead of feeding the microbe 
iron, you would feed it to, and then they would take that electrons from the iron to for energy, you feed them the electrons directly from a cathode in this case. So the electrons are being given out and the, micro, the microbes then would be taking them if they have these conductive, they have these conductive pathways. And so we then stuck the stuck these rock chips in there and incubate, like incubated them for a couple of it's a couple of a week or so. The idea being that you have your community of microbes that are on the that are on the rock, and you stick your electrode in there that's in this case at 0.2 volts, which is roughly equivalent to where the iron oxidizing iron oxidizing microbes generally are, and then you'd select for those cells that can only do this reaction, which gives you, it actually gives you a measurable signal because you can, you have your current over time, which is your electron flow over time will change depending on how your microbes are pulling in, how your microbes are pulling the electrons. So the more microbes there are pulling the electrons, the more the current goes up. Or in the plot, it looks like it goes down because the, the negative single in this case talks about electron direction, electron flow direction, not negative, not numerical negative. And that's kind of what we found. In particular, and this plot shows you current over time on these different substrates, mostly basalt. But the strongest signal that we get is from the glass wall, which doesn't really make sense in that there is an inert substance. But we think that what was going on is that there was like these were acting as packers. So all the bio biomass was coming through. So it was acting almost like a filter. And like there's like a concentration effect going on, which means that probably what we're seeing is measuring activity, not growth. So the because we're measuring the electrons directly, that's what we're doing. We're measuring exactly their respiration energy. And then you can see when we look at the slides, so the image on the left is the this these the cell setup but without the electricity and then the image on the right has the electricity this current passing through you can see these little cockroids in the site that has electricity versus the one that doesn't which tells us there is something in this from there is something in this community that can use this solid electro solid elect have the solid electron pathway for this 0.2 volts which we're assuming is equivalent to ion oxidation we can look at who they are which again is this is a relative abundance plot so how often this particular identity of microbe crops up relative to the overall community. And you can see when we look at the, the shipboard, the SB samples versus the time zero. So at the start of the experiment, there was some change, which has some sort of storage effect going on because the shipboard was a community that was preserved straight away. And the time zero is the live samples that have been sat for a while. But the important part is that there is a difference here between the, the size of the spots and the color, which tells you how much relative abundance there is. And you can see there's a difference between, there's a switch in the community between the offline, which is there was no electricity, and the online, so there was this 0.2 volts passing through.
And then you can have a look at, when we look at the microbial, you can dig into this a little bit further by looking at the genus level. Again, you can see a difference between the shipboard and the, 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 the cell that had the, the samples that had the electricity passing through. There's also a bit of a difference between the stored and the shipboard again. And the stored stuff is similar, looks more similar to the offline stuff. But the important part is that this, there's definitely something being enriched in the purple. When we look at the identity of that, it's a uh, Ralstonia, which is slightly problematic because these are often assumed to be contaminants in marine environments. However, we, also, we do know of strains that can oxidize iron using oxygen, which is what we were looking for. They're also, they also like, they're like organic carbon, which would explain, possibly explain the what that we were seeing activity rather than growth because we weren't supplying them with something that they would need to to dive, to start dividing and actually multiplying. We also know that they can form cocoids in starvation conditions and they're active at four degrees Celsius, not room temperature, which makes sense with some of the preliminary experiments that we did. So either they crept in as a contaminant at some point, which is possible with these very, very low biomass samples, or they might actually be from their deep ocean. We also have studies that show them cropping up in deep terrestrial environments, but anyway, if you want to learn more about that, we have a nice little paper out about it. Okay, so what does that then, all very interesting, but what does that tell us about what microbes like to eat and what that might tell us about the environment? Well, in the hydrothermal vent, the hydrothermal vents, we can see that there is evidence of iron cycling going on in the very dead, very off axis dead stuff with this thick, goopy iron rind, which the mi microbes might be responsible for, and it does makes sense if there are microbes that they're that this thick iron line would be more easily the signal would be most easily picked up when there's more of it having had time to develop so it's possible we just need to have a to be continued on that one there's a few more bit more work we need to do to confirm or deny that one and in terms of but it does tell us that the, we can look at the environment to tell us about the life that's there because there's Obviously, it's some sort of iron that's been cycled. We can also, for the cool oxic basalt stuff, we can then say we can say that yes, microbes. There are my, there are microbes that can do this iron oxidation solid substrate reaction. So this this reaction is possible, and we know that it makes sense that it there is it makes sense that it would they would do that. But if have we actually identified the one that did it, that's a little more questionable. But it does, in terms of asking the microbes what they can tell us about the environment, it's like, well, if it's possible, then there's an awful lot of surface area for this extra surface area that's available for this reaction going on. All of which tells us that we can we can look at the deep sea how the deep sea floor works from the microbes eye view and also the rocks perspective to how they how they interact together. And I add credits at the end. With that, any questions? Great, thanks a lot, Rose. Um, yeah, so to our attendees, um, feel free to use your the chat window to post some questions for Rose. Rose, can you see the chat window from your point of view? Um, Is your screen open? It's okay if you can, I'll read the questions to you. I, I think so, yes, but I see everything smooshed together. Okay, well, well, I'll keep an eye on it as they're coming in. 
I have a question for you to get this started, if you don't mind. Um, the results from your episode one story about um, the uh, hydrothermal chimneys on the East Pacific rise, your results that you see that iron sulfide, the more reactive iron sulfide, and even pyrotite a little bit, more abundant in the rind um, and uh, in the dead chimneys, I find fascinating. Um, it's, it's kind of the opposite of what I might have expected. Um, I'm curious what, what your explanation is for how that generation of this more reactive iron species with less reactive conditions, um, what, what's driving that, do you know? Um, well, I will say that I was doing, I was finishing processing, processing this information this morning because we're all that organized. So this is all fresh off the press as it were. But if we think about it in terms of, I've seen, if we think about it, in terms of, oh, well, we've seen this sort of thick iron rind also in, like, in the acid mine drainage environments, which I'm sort of, sort of in my background, you can see that those are usually where the microbes are, and these biofilms start to build up. And then you get the microbes that are, so it's, the basic, the best explanation I can come up with so far is that there is some biological mediation going on because they would be the ones catalyzing these different reactions. And particularly with the iron two, they're being, we're picking up some iron two in there's two separate techniques we're smushing together, but we're picking up iron two in, in one and the other. One's more reliable, but we're still trying to tease that one out. But it's like, well, that wouldn't be there if it was purely oxidate, purely abiotic because you wouldn't expect that to be expected to be. So I would expect, so that's my, that's my best guess at the moment, so it might be evidence of this biolog biologically mediated cycling, which is why it's a to be continued because we then hopefully get some microbial information to be able to confirm or deny that. So, okay. to answer your question. Yes, thank you. Good luck. <laughs> um. Okay, uh, there's a question here for you from the audience, um, from Karen Lloyd. How phylogenetically widespread do you think the ability to respire solid iron surfaces, the surfaces of solid iron, how widespread do you think that ability is? Um, yeah, and that's, it's a bit of a, a broader to be continued, <laughs> a broader to be continued answer because we're picking them up when we're looking for them, but they haven't really been looked for before. So, which is a bit of a fudgy answer, but there are, we have these model organisms like um, Schuanella and Geobacter that there's a lot of information on them because they've been looked at into, they've been looked at in detail. But when you go out to other environments, you can start to see evidence of that. But a lot of the times, because we only have the information on these model organisms, it can be harder to pick them up in other studies because we might not have the other information that we need. It's like, oh, well, we have the signal and we have this community, but it's hard to tease apart who in this community that we are seeing because we might be harder to find the specific um, information in the, like the, the, genetic information to tell us that's the case. Okay. Um, there's a, another question here um, that I will try to in, uh, do my best to relay um, from Myrna Jacobson. Um, the question is about, uh, again, going back to episode one and um, the hydrothermal minerals that you're seeing there. The question is about um, the possible association of the iron sulfur species with iron oxyhydroxide abundance. Um, and um, what you think the balance might be between microbial versus kind of like super catalytic interaction between the iron sulfides and the iron oxyhydroxides. I hope I got that right, Myrna. Um, yeah, I'll go back to... That's a, that's a good question and that's one of the... It's kind of one of the to be continued bins because when we look at the 
these other alterations, they rust, these oxyhydroxides are in here. And we know that there's, when we've been some details we just still need to dig into, but things like this metals being possibly like metals being associated or like, um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's in the to be continued, but we have all these, it's a really complicated system. So working out that, that proportion between the two is, yeah, definitely in the to be continued. So again, it's a really fudgy answer. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, a question here from Jan Arland. Um, in your detailed iron mineral analysis, do you ever see metallic iron or iron zero? Or would you see it with the methods that you're using? Um, oh, again with a fudgy answer. You guys are not helping me. <laughs> um, well, a bit like when you're looking at the different minerals, it's a bit like um, you have to again, especially with this, um, comparing it to a database, you have to consider carefully what you're getting out versus what the computer is telling you. So we are seeing, we have seen some possible identified iron zero like this, this Fe3C is a carbide, but that's usually crops up in, in um, iron smelting that would be an iron zero. And it's like, well, there is an iron zero signal, but it normally crops up in iron smelting, not in the sea floor. So that's one that you have to sort of think a little bit more about as to whether that's possible or not. So, but at the moment, I'm going with the theory that if it's involved in the smelting, like the Fe3SI also, it's like, well, Maybe that's a bit of ship that fell in by mistake, a bit of dust, or it's some, some sort of thing that needs to be investigated further in the methods to be able to say definitively one way or the other. Mainly because I don't have any reason to think that it would be down there. But if you have anything, do let me know. Because it would be an interest, it would good to good to sanity check some of these more ambiguous, these ambiguous results. So. Um, just checking here. Um, okay, so there's a question here from Stephanie Carr referring to um, the experiment two or episode two with your voice potential experiments. Um, uh, the question is about in those uh, cathodic experiments, um, are there replicates and was it possible that the um, or, or the possible contaminants always in the in like the duplicates or replicates? Um, and what was your method for um, evaluating uh, like no template controls or um, uh, you know, the offline control versus your like method control? I hope I got that question. <laughs> yeah. Did it make sense to you? I finally one that I can answer definitively. Um, that one, yes, there were replicates and um, this, this result, you can see across this, across this um, plot, you can see that going from pink, this dark pink to light blue, these are the replicates from the different basalt. So we took some basalt that had been in the seafloor and stuck it in a cell and then ran it again. Or like, I think we were actually not a I think we ran it in parallel. So, but there were replicates and this, is this result is yeah this result is it was the one question I could definitively answer and it's gone <laughs> the do you want to ask the question again? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yeah, so the question was both about running uh, replicates of the experiments to see if you got the same results, but also part of the question was what were the um, uh, controls you used in your sequencing to evaluate if those contaminants were from sequencing or actually like things that were in your experiment 
that were not contaminants. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there were replicates because we show them in this little plot. And this is generally what we get. The controls we had, start with we had the experiment controls. So we had comparison between the shipboard, the fresh stuff, and then the stored stuff can count for the stored effects. And then we had, we would have had, we had the replicates just to make sure that the, the result that we're getting is still consistent. We also have the offline control, which is the, it's the, there was always one cell which had, there was one set which had a cathode, which was except had the same cathode, it had the same materials, it had the same fluid, but it didn't, the only thing difference really is it didn't have the electricity passing through. So that's the offline control. So those are the experiment controls. We also had in the sequencing, we had a control where we sequenced just the, the, the reagents that we were using to make sure there was nothing cropping in from there because obviously the deep sea floor stuff it's very low biomass and so these were sequences were taken out of this plot so i hope that answers the question yep well stephanie can follow up with you if not yeah anyone if you want to know more do let me know the in my email is on the front of the presentation so. great um Looks like that was the end of the online questions. Um, so uh, I hope everybody joins me in clapping to say thank you for Rose um, for sharing these stories from the deep sea with us. Um, we wish you well in your future experiments. Um, and to folks that are still online, a reminder that the next network speaker series is on November 5th. Uh, featuring Dr. Julia McGonigal. So we hope you join us again. And I'm sure that Matt will be posting this recording online. So if you um, want to revisit any of this, we have that opportunity. Thanks, everybody. And thanks again, Rose.